video, so real quick, if you like what you're watching, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when new videos come out, and make sure to read the video description because that's where all the relevant information is going to be. You'll see things like deck lists, group information like Facebook and Reddit, my contact information, and anything else you may need to know. So now that we're done there, let's get right into the spooky content. Yo, what's good Spirit Squad? It's your boy Dre, and today we're going to have a conversation about Innistrad Crimson Vow. As of right now, this is going to drop in like a week and a half, and there's a lot of new spirits coming out of this set. It is really hype, it's really dope, and we've got a lot to go over. Also, since I haven't really gotten to speak with y'all in a bit, we're going to have a bit of a mailbag here with a lot of the questions that I've received from y'all. So we're going to go ahead and get some opinions in, see what's what. And this is going to be something I'm going to want to continue to. So if y'all want to send me more questions, be it uh, via Twitter DM, Facebook message if I know you personally, um, whatever, email works, YouTube comments, anything that I can see, I'll answer, you know. So... Yeah, do that, and I'll address your concerns as they come up. But for now, we have a lot to go over, so just we're just going to jump right into it. So for our first question here, uh, what we got is, Marillo's asking, I'm using the mono blue version of Spirits in Historic, but I lack the wild cards for Shacklegeists, so I've been using Nebelgast Herald instead. What do you think about this substitution? Do you think Shacklegeist is really superior to Herald? What do you think your uh, sideboard suggestions for a current meta in Historic? Okay, so we're going to address each of those in parts because I think uh, there's a lot here. So it's okay if you don't have the wild cards for Shacklegeist. You can use Nebelgast Herald instead. Um, I prefer Shacklegeist in a deck that has Curious Obsession only because Shacklegeist costs 2 instead of 3. That means that you'll be attacking with a potential Curious Obsession on the Shacklegeist a whole turn earlier, and that's really what I think matters more than the fact that the tap effect is better or worse than the Nebelgast's Herald um, tap ability. But other than that, honestly, I do think the substitution is fine. I have played Nebelgast Herald in Mono Blue before, and realistically, I probably will again. Um, if you want to put in multiple Heralds, like three or more, what I think I would choose to do in your space would just be to put in like one extra land in your deck so that you're more reliably hitting that third land and you're able to actually cast your Heralds. You don't want to mess around and get stuck with a three drop in hand and really be unable to cast it. So I think that's going to be my suggestion if you are going to continue playing Herald rather than Shacklegeist, because honestly most of the rest of it's completely fine. Um, also, what would your sideboard suggestions be for the current meta in Historic? So let's actually look at Historic and see what it's doing here. So here we've got Sacrifice, Blue Red Phoenix, um, White Green Collect the Company, and a bunch of little creatures, Niv Mizzet. And if that's going to be the top of the meta, that tells us that a lot of the meta is going to be really permanent based, which means that I think I would gear towards having more removal than not in your sideboard. So. If you're able to afford or already have copies of like Brazen Bower, I think that would do you some good against like Resolved Mayhem Devils and uh, Smoldering Egg slash um, Arclight Phoenix, things like that. All of the creatures from the white green deck um, are usually okay to put, you know, in your opponent's hands, uh, minus like Thalia's Lieutenant, because, you know, you don't want to give them the Enter the Battlefield effect again. Uh, but against niv Mizzet, you can bounce like niv Mizzet itself and just keep those big giant permanents off the table. Against Jeskai Control, it still has some use there because you can get rid of like Shark Typhoon tokens and things like that. So I think that's going to be my first suggestion is going to be to play something like Brazen Bower. And if you don't have or can't afford that, that's still okay. There are other things that work about as well. Like I've played, um, Mystic Subduel in the past, and that not only gives a creature minus two minus zero, but it also removes all of that creature's abilities. So, for example, a Smoldering Egg with a Mystic um, Subduel on it will never transform. Um, a Niv Mizzet can't fly. A Mayhem Devil won't actually have any triggered abilities, things like that. And if you're playing against Merfolk, it's nice there too, because you'll be able to turn off potentially Island Walk abilities. So that's really nice because, you know, you're a deck playing nothing but Islands. 
Um, as for the rest of the sideboard, I think I'm a pretty big fan of playing things like Mystical Dispute in some number because like Phoenix is good, Niv Mizzet is good, the control decks are good, and it counters the entire Merfolk deck. So that's going to be something to kind of uh, keep an eye out for as well. So that's going to be my sideboard suggestions for um, Historic, and that's going to be, I guess, my input for playing Nebelgast Herald over Shacklegeist. So I hope that helped. So next up is going to be Ken, and oh, you know what? As of right now, I think you're about to be in your first round of a 4K in the state away from um, adjacent to me. So good luck in that if I got the timing right. I think that's today. Um, but the question goes, hey, I was just wondering how relevant Chalice is right now in the broadscape of the format. Aside from the obvious countering, crashing, footfall, and living end, I can't understand how or why they are of any use and why every Azorius deck runs at least two in the sideboard. Okay, so of course Chalice on Zero is good against both of those decks, and both of those decks will come up fairly often. Um, a lot of people play Living End, and a lot of people play Rhinos, whatever. Um, the reason that people are playing Chalice outside of those decks, because realistically you could just play something that doesn't cost like $75. You can play like Void Mirror or uh, whatever the new version of Nyx is called or Flusterstorm if you're only worried about those two decks. But Chalice on 1 also helps with a lot of other decks too. Like on the play, it's very good against Hammer Time um, because it stops them from being able to cast any copies of Colossus Hammer, which is really nice. It stops things like the Blue Red Prowess deck from killing your creatures with Lightning Bolt and Unholy Heat, or not Prowess deck, I'm sorry, the Blue Red Merc Tide deck. But there are still some people playing Prowess, so if you run across that, it'll stop that too. And Lava Dart still really sucks for us. Um, You'll see people still playing, like, the Death Shadow decks are making a comeback, both Jund and Grixis. Actually, I think Reed Duke just highlighted a Jund Shadow list, like, a few days ago, so that'll be a little more on the upswing. And that'll stop a lot of the Unholy Heats, Lightning Bolts, Fatal Pushes, things like that from that deck. And you just don't really want to deal with all of that removal, so whenever you're playing against a Jund deck, it's just nice to have Chalice as a out to most of their removal. You know, they're still going to have things like Abrupt Decay, Culligan's Command, stuff like that. But Chalice hits most of the removal, and that's really nice. So those are going to be some of the things that you really want to make sure that Chalice, you know, can help you out with if you can afford the Chalices. And if you can't, that's fine. We haven't always had to play Chalice. It just happens to be pretty good right now. So good luck in the rest of your tournament today, though. So I'm pretty sure I got the date right. So yeah, I don't know. Fingers crossed. Represent the Spirit Squad. And for our last question of the day, Kellen asks, uh, why do the Azoria Spirit decks always drop the card enchantments? Okay, so I'm going to assume this is referencing a uh, curious obsession in the world of Pioneer. And for the most part, the reason Azoria decks just aren't playing cards like Curious Obsession is because they want to basically emulate what the modern decks are doing, and they just want to play nothing but a giant pile of creatures to kind of always apply pressure and playing curious obsession takes away from the creature density which is honestly like okay to go with as a route like the azorius deck with watch of the spheres is still ultra powerful it can go very aggressive very quickly and that is a pretty good spot to be in life in pioneer against a lot of the decks um but I'm not going to go so far as to say that I think it is strictly better to play it like that because, I mean, I'm a fan of Curious Obsession anyway, but also um, I'm actually got a list to highlight here. I played a preliminary event a few months ago now. This is before um, the first Innistrad set came out, so this is without access to uh, Denik in the sideboard. This is without access to Deserted Beach as like a relatively sweet two of land or anything like that. And we were still able to take this list and go 4-0 um, and 8-0 in games overall, like went undefeated all four rounds um, with a blue-white pioneer list with Curious Obsession in it. So um, if you want to check this out here, and this is going to be a list that you can go ahead and kind of um, screenshot, but you'll see where we've got, you know, the full eight 
one drop creatures of spectral sail and mausoleum wanderers we've got four curious obsession and a lot of one mana ways to protect them we've got spell pierces and three copies of uc a guard approach that way your creatures are a little bit less susceptible to things like spot removal when you're putting a curious obsession on it and looking to protect them um we've also got the full four copies of watcher the spheres here and the trade-off because you want to be able to function at a lower mana point as you know a curious obsession deck we've got just three copies of spell queller in the main instead of four and the fourth one's going to be in the sideboard here it's been a few months since i've touched this list but i think it definitely has a lot of potential to succeed um we still have a good 22 lands and some of the tools that we'll be talking about later in this video i think will provide a lot of good help here like instead of fiend slayer paladin costing three we can play denic that costs two instead um instead of soul guide lantern there's a new version um of relica progenitus that we have the ability to play in that spot if you're really worried about graveyard decks um portable hole is still just as busted as ever and that's definitely something that can be updated if you want to play curious obsession in your azorius list so i'm hoping that gives you a little bit of hope and you know um thanks everybody for you know just messaging me asking kind of what's up keeping me engaged with y'all because i really like talking with the community and everything and yeah let's get right into these spoilers uh so yeah like we said we got a lot of stuff to talk about since the spoilers are full of spirits this is gonna be i guess the uh more spirit focused of the two innistrad sets that are coming out and that means that we got a lot of cool new stuff to play with uh we got some sweet mythics we got a couple of new creatures that involve combat tricks we got a one drop um so yeah we're just gonna start digging right into all of the cards that honestly i think are interesting so i hope that at least some of these are appealing to y'all as well so the first one we're going to go over here is going to be one of the mythics that are out. It's Cemetery Illuminator. It's going to be one double blue for a 2-3 flyer. Whenever this thing enters the battlefield or attacks, you exile a card from a graveyard. You can also look at the top card of your deck whenever. Uh, once each turn, you can cast a spell from the top of your library if it shares a card type with any of the cards you exiled with Cemetery Illuminator. And I think this card's okay. I don't know that it's great, but I think it's okay. You have the ability to, um, you know, obviously play creatures off the top of your deck, which is pretty decent. And the once per turn thing, I don't think that's going to be ultra relevant because of the fact that, you know, you're not necessarily going to have enough mana to play like two and three spells chaining together in a row anyway. So I think the once per turn is really kind of flavor text on this card. But. I wish this card had flash so you could, you know, um, play just a little nicer with the exiling a card from a graveyard. And that actually matters a lot in formats like Modern and Pioneer because in Pioneer you have things like Dreadhorde Arcanist. And in Modern you just have like a lot of cards that you don't really want to stick around in graveyards. Um, you have like, you know, dredge decks all the time. You have miscellaneous things that Luris can do and get rid of, but you don't really want to be tapping out either because you're playing things like Spell Queller. So I think this card is like okay, but probably best suited for like sideboards maybe against control decks or something. But even then, I don't necessarily know that this is the kind of effect that I want. I think if we want a creature to be generating card advantage, um... There's another creature that's the same stats and basically the same function for spirits, and which it's funny because it's not even a spirit. Uh, this actually, I think, is going to be one of the most exciting cards for us out of the entire set, and like I said, it's not even a spirit. So the card I think is going to be really hype for us is going to be actually Welcoming Vampire. And Welcoming Vampire is two and a white for a 2-3 flyer, so basically the same stats as the other one, except you don't get to pump it with Supreme Phantom. And whenever one or more other creatures with power two or less enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. This only triggers once per turn. I think Welcoming Vampire has some real potential in Pioneer Spirits decks, and if you're playing a deck like Blue White or Bant in uh, Historic, there as well. I don't know that this makes it in modern, but this is really good. Like we get access to a two, three flyer, which 
whatever, that fits our deck perfectly. Like, we're already a deck of 2-2 two, two, and 2-3 two, flyers. And you get to draw cards every time you play a creature. Just, well, okay, not every time, once a turn. But once during one of your turns and once during one of their turns. So it's like, okay, you play Welcoming Vampire and something else, draw a card. Your opponent's turn, you play like a Spectral Sailor or something, draw a card. That's crazy value and i think this card's got a lot of potential in our deck like I, it's probably better suited for us than it is for vampires if i'm being completely honest um i'm a little sad that this creature type isn't actually spirit but you know what whatever i will probably play this card and be pretty excited to do so uh so we're gonna go ahead and move right on to what i think is gonna be another exciting one here and this is gonna be uh dorothea i think dorothea is relatively hype even if she's not necessarily like you know crazy like i don't think this card deserves to be a mythic but i think it deserves a discussion so for dorothea vengeful victim uh she's w w white and a blue so just two mana for a four four flyer and whenever she attacks or blocks sacrifice at the end of combat um which whatever you get a four four for two it should come with some kind of drawback right but then it's got disturb and when you disturb it, the back half is going to be, um, what is it called? Dorothea's Vengeance or something? Dorothea's Retribution. So it's an enchant creature, and it gives you, whenever you attack, you get a 4-4 angel that gets sacrificed at the, I'm sorry, it's actually a spirit. That's even better. It's not an angel. You get a 4-4 white spirit token that's tapped and attacking. You sacrifice that spirit at the end of combat. Um... It's actually even better that the Dorothea's Retribution makes a spirit. I thought it was an angel, and I was already pretty happy with it. Um, so that means you can actually pump the token, too, with Supreme Phantoms and stuff. So that's pretty exciting. Um, this card is basically a carbon copy of Invocation of Saint Traft. So if any of y'all remember that, it's it's this. But Invocation of Saint Traft doesn't come with a 4-4 spirit. Um, so that'll be pretty sweet. Like, if you have a Rattle Chains, a 4-4 spirit is a huge surprise blocker you get to just like have a giant beat stick if you're on an aggro plan and that'll do you a lot of good against a lot of control decks and stuff like that like they don't want to deal with a boros charm out of a deck that's playing spell queller um and that's basically what a four damage attacker is to them is just a boros charm so i think that dorothea has a decent amount of potential i don't know that she's necessarily um the best thing for us to be playing but i will be looking forward to people at least trying to play her another cool thing to notice about um dorothea's triggered ability too the one that makes her sacrifice herself so it's at the end of combat um which means that if you use an effect that will like flicker or um blink dorothea herself then that actually resets the ability so you get to keep your 4-4. Four four. So if you use something like um, Spectral Adversary to face her out, then she doesn't need to worry about being sacrificed. If you use a card like Essence Flux to, you know, exile and then immediately bring back in, well, that's technically a new Dorothea, so she's not going to see the new copy, I guess, um, when it's time to remember the sacrifice trigger the Dorothea that comes in off of the blink is no longer, you know, um, the Dorothea that attacked. So you don't have to sacrifice it. So there's a few ways to kind of play around this. If you want to really kind of be cute and do blink effects, that, those are things that are possible. But I don't necessarily know that that's necessary, but it's something that can be built around. Um, so that's one thing to be on the lookout for. Like our sweet new powerful rare can be even more powerful if you build for it. The next thing I think I want to go over here is actually not going to be a spirit at all, but it's going to be a counterspell, and that's going to be Geistlight Snare. Um, this card I am very excited for. So Geistlight Snare is uh, two and a blue, counter target spell, and lets its controller pace three. So basically it's a three mana mana leak. Um, this spell costs one less to con if you control a spirit. It also costs one less if you control an enchantment. And that means that, you know, if you have both an enchantment and a spirit on the table, then you get to play Geistlight Snare for just one mana and they have to pay three or their thing is countered. Um, there are a couple of really good ways to power this out as early as turn two. Um, probably the most obvious of which is going to be Hateful Eidolon, which is both an enchantment and a spirit. Um, 
and some of y'all might remember this from the Black White Auras deck. This is a card that's already seeing some play. But for us, you know, when um, it's just a one-two Black Spirit that, you know, gives you the ability to cast Geistlight Snare as early as turn two. And whenever an enchanted creature dies, you draw a card for every aura you controlled that was attached to it. And there's a lot of play that you can have around Hateful Eidolon. Like, Hateful Eidolon plus a Curious Obsession means that you just have a lot of fuel throughout the course of a game. Because, you know, if you hit, it's going to draw you a card. If they kill it with an Obsession on it, you're still going to get to draw a card. So that's pretty sweet. If you have a Hateful Eidolon on the table, you cast, like, a dead weight at your opponent's creature, and that creature dies to the minus two... Well, that still counts. You're going to draw a card. So there's a lot of great ways to play around this, and I think it's worth exploring if you can make Hateful Eidolon turn your Geistlight Snare into a one-mana counterspell, especially in the world of Pioneer. So that's going to be something I think to kind of look out for and maybe build towards. I will probably be trying that combination of cards at some point soon, to be completely honest, because I think it's interesting. Uh, so what's next on our list here? Ooh, here's another sweet spirit mythic. We've got Faithbound Judge, and this card does something that we have never had the ability to do. So this is going to be a 1 and double white for a 4-4 four, four with Flying and Vigilance, but it has Defender. Um, at the beginning of your upkeep, if this thing has two or fewer Judgment counters on it, you put a Judgment counter on it. So... Then, if it's got three or more judgment counters on it, it can attack as though it didn't have defender. Okay, so at the start, you get a pretty good blocker. Again, a 4-4 is just huge out of spirits, um, especially a 4-4 flying blocker. Like, that's just really good for the rate. And after the third turn, you can start attacking with it, which honestly I think is way too long for us to be able to play this card reliably. But it's still something that's cool. I think this will see play somewhere um what i really like this card for though is going to be the back half and this is again cool i don't know that it's playable but i think it's cool you enchant a player it costs seven for sinner's judgment and at the beginning of your upkeep you put a judgment counter on this thing and then if there are three or more judgment counters enchanted player straight up loses the game um so you can play this against like blue black control that's just not really packing very many win conditions or blue white control that's just trying to like beat you upside the head with like teferi and stuff but otherwise doesn't have very many win conditions and when you're playing against these type of really slow decks in a world left pioneer then having a really inevitable source of victory is something that is at least worth looking into Honestly, I don't think this is going to end up really making the cut anywhere, but again, it is super freaking cool. So if somebody wants to build around this, because you get, you know, you get an attacker, you get a win condition, and it's still really cool either way. Or if you want to put this in a deck like Control that can play the front half where you're just like a 4-4 Flying Vigilance blocker for 3, that's really good against almost all of the creature decks. And then you get this win condition outside here that functions essentially like a... almost as well as like Approach to Second Sons, but Approach doesn't come with a 3-mana blocker. So, who knows? Maybe it has some potential in the control decks. That could be pretty sweet to check out. So, I think this card is certainly cool enough to be a mythic i don't think it's good enough to make spirits but i do think that this card is gonna see play somewhere probably in a blue white control list just as a really efficient blocker um speaking of really good white creatures for us we have Catilda, Dawn Heart Martyr. And this card I think is relatively cool. I don't know that it's good enough for us to play again, but I think it's really cool. It's a three mana star star, and star is gonna be the number of spirits plus the number of enchantments you have. And it's gonna be flying and lifelink and protection from vampires, which whatever, this is a vampire centric block, so so be it. Um and you know, I think it's okay. Like you'll not really want this against like the red decks or against anything um but it's potentially a huge creature so like if you're playing against something aggressive like mono red in pioneer or like green red just having a flying lifelinker is already like 
at least medium upside. But then you have a Disturb too. And Disturb is for five mana, you get to enchant one of your creatures and that creature is gonna have Flying Lifelink Pro Vampires and then the plus X plus X. So I think this is actually a lot more exciting than the, uh, <laughs> than the front half, hilariously enough. Cause if you can give some, one of your high toughness creatures like a Supreme Phantom, just, you know, plus two or three extra power and lifelink and take it from like a one three to like a three five. I think that's actually um, got a lot of potential to just make, you know, a card half decent when you're like fighting removal for removal or removal for your creatures against a deck like red, which can remove all your creatures. And then all of a sudden, kablam, you've got like Katilda's Rising Dawn on, I don't know, one of your one drops or something. And all of a sudden they're stuck dealing with like a giant life linker. Like that's really annoying for them to deal with. Um, so I think this card has a little bit of potential. I don't know that it necessarily makes the cut. And I honestly don't even know that it's better than something that we're already playing like Denik. But I do think that it's again, worth exploring at the very least. Uh, what else do we have here? Ooh, this one's really cute. So, Mischievous Cat Geist. Now, it's a cat spirit, and it doesn't fly, but whenever this thing deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So it's already got its own built-in Curious Obsession. And even though this card does not fly, I think having a built-in Curious Obsession on a 2-drop that is also a spirit, which means we can protect it with things like um, Rattle Chains, I think that is actually good enough to maybe warrant some sideboard spots. Like, if you play this Mischievous Cat Geist against things like Blue Black and against things like Blue White, then... You know, you're probably going to get in like a good hit, maybe even two before they're able to really solve this problem with like a spot removal spell or a supreme verdict or something like that. And honestly, I don't think that's a bad. That's a bad. Like you can play Mischievous Cat Geist. It can draw you into, you know, your land drops against the slower decks. You can draw you into things like Selfless Spirit against the blue white decks against. Uh, you can draw you into Spell Queller. It can draw you into Rattle Chains and more counter magic. I think this card has a surprising amount of potential out of the sideboard for us because usually effects like this either uh, make you draw and then discard if they cost two or they let you draw a card but they cost three. Getting to draw a card and only be two mana is actually really almost exactly what we wanted like it would of course it would be nice if this thing flew but like then you'd have to have some kind of drawback and i think just being a 1-1 non-flyer is a big enough drawback but a good enough reason for us to potentially play this out of the sideboard against like the slower decks like if you want to put this in your pioneer sideboard as a two of against blue white control i think that's probably appropriate because you know we really just don't want to be running out of fuel Speaking of which, this card has Disturb, and the Disturb part of this thing is going to be Cat-like Curiosity, which I also think is super cute because the picture is literally playing Cat's Cradle, um, so that's that's kind of adorable, right? And this thing, you know, enchants one of your creatures, and whenever that creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So not only do you have a Curious Cat, now you get to play Curiosity on one of your creatures after Haha. -ha, curiosity i guess killed the cat or you know the cat's curiosity got it killed or whatever phrase you want to use for that the joke's there and that's still going to be a good re-upped source of card advantage because like if you can flash in like a spectral sailor at the end of their turn after they cast like a supreme verdict and then you can untap cast cat like curiosity now they're stuck dealing with you know another threat that's just still drawing them cards after they dealt with your threat that was drawing you cards like you're just not running out of gas with this thing and i think that's still um a good enough reason to play like probably two is is probably the appropriate point for this card out of your sideboard but i'm really hyped to at least give this thing a shot because i think it's got some real potential out of the spirit sideboards and it might even find it's like best home in a deck like mono blue or like simic where you're more likely to want things to protect it because you're already playing curious obsession in those decks um let's see what else did we miss oh here's another one 
we've got Dream Shacklegeist. Now, Dream Shacklegeist for 1 and 2 blue is going to be a 3 1 flyer, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, you can either tap a creature or choose a tapped creature and it doesn't untap. So, if you want to, like, Dream Shacklegeist to either tap something or free something, then, you know, that's going to be something that's there. And you don't have to invest mana or creatures every turn to do it. So, if you're playing like Nebelgast Herald, then you have to invest mana because you're playing creatures and they have to resolve in order to tap down your opponent's stuff. If you're playing Shacklegeist, you have to invest two creatures in order to tap one of theirs. With this Dream Shacklegeist, you just have to have it on the table and make it to your combat step, and that's the entire list of requirements. With that said, I still don't think this card is better than either Shacklegeist or Nebelgast Herald. Um, being a 3-1 instead of a 2-1 is respectable when you're comparing it to Nebelgast Herald, but Nebelgast Herald can tap things on their turn, making your opponent potentially unable to attack. Dream Shacklegeist does not have the ability to do that, and I think that's a really big deal, especially when there are decks like Green Red and like Mono Red Burn in the format. Also, getting to repeatedly control your creature's ability to attack is really, really important, and Shacklegeist helps out a lot with that. That helps out a lot in Spirit's Mirrors because those come up fairly often. It's going to come up against black-white auras, against all of the humans' decks, and you just really don't want to be caught out there sleeping without ways to repeatedly tap your opponent's creatures on their turn and negate their ability to attack. Like, half of the point of playing Spirits is that we get to very efficiently control how combat works because we have both tap effects and flying and that's why we can get away with playing a deck that's full of two ones and no removal and we still beat most of the creature decks that's kind of the whole point of playing our deck um and i think dream shacklegeist is almost a hit but we have true hits with shacklegeist so i don't think this is going to be um uh, the, the dream here. I think uh, actual Shacklegeist is going to be where it's at for the foreseeable future if we're going to be comparing it to the stream Shacklegeist. So, sorry buddy, maybe next time. Uh, do we have any more spirits to go over? So, I... Ooh! We have a big one to go over, as a matter of fact. Um, we have a one drop. So, Lantern Bear. So, this is not a particularly impressive one drop, but it is another one drop, and it's actually really important for those folks who want to go around playing cards like Curious Obsession, because just having a, another flying one drop that can, you know, carry Curious Obsession and not worry about blockers is just a huge place to be. Like, I don't necessarily know that Lantern Bearer is going to be enough to take people from playing Snow to not Snow in the example of... Um, you know, comparing it directly to Ascendant Spirit. But if you're playing, say, Simic Spirits, and you wanted to do Curious Obsession plus Six Sense, and you wanted to have another spirit-typed creature instead of playing, I don't know, like Siren Storm Tamer or something, Lantern Bearers, well, it fits that role perfectly. It's just another 1-1 one, one Flying Spirit, and that's good enough to carry a Curious Obsession on it. Also, it's got Disturb, and on the back half... Um, do I have a picture of the back half of this thing? I don't think so. I don't. Whatever. It costs three. And you give the enchanted creature plus one, plus one, and flying. Um, our whole deck already flies, so that's not terribly important. But, you know, a plus one pump is a plus one pump. Sometimes that might come up. Who knows? Um, but, yeah, I think this card will be good enough to see play as like a two of um alongside your four mausoleum wanderers alongside your four spectral sailors in decks that want to play curious obsession and are not mono blue because mono blue still got ascendant spirit like you're not replacing that with this um but you will definitely play like two of these in your simic spirits lists because just having 10 good one drops instead of just eight it gives you a lot more consistency when you want to put on curious obsession and or six cents on your creatures on turn two giving you know yourselves the ability to play all the way up to 12 flying spirit typed one drop creatures um is really good because that gives you so much consistency in that list starting on turn two so i like this card for that purpose i don't think this is going to make any other version of spirits but if any y'all are watching or listening and you, you know, are a fan of Simic Spirits, this thing's for you. 
But I think that is going to cover us for all of the spoilers, at least the ones that I think are particularly important for the the spirits deck. Um, also, something that I'm going to gush about basically forever. Um, for everybody who's watched any of my modern content, y'all know I am a huge, huge fan of playing Thalia in that deck. Um, Thalia is in Crimson Vow. I love this card so much. Um, and I already super love Thalia, but like, also look at this picture. Like, what? She's so gorgeous in this picture. I'm such a fan. Um, I'm really hyped for this. Like, getting to play Thalia in Pioneer Spirits is going to end up being a really big deal, especially for people who want to play the decks that we mentioned before, just like the blue white decks that have just a giant pile of spirits and almost no other non-creature spells like Thalia is pretty perfect in those environments because you know you get to just make so many of your opponents spell based days miserable or if you want to just like play Thalia in your sideboard against some certain decks like against mono red against the control decks of the format then that will be an option for everybody who wants to play pioneer so this is this is going to be a very very hype thing for me for like months i'm gonna gush about this card until at least christmas so for anybody who uh is not a fan of thalia or is not a fan of this thalia i don't know what to tell you you're watching the wrong channel i'm i'm gonna be just a giant hype beast about this forever i'm probably gonna end up with like 12 copies of this card by the time the first week is over because i'm just gonna i'm just gonna trade for or buy every single copy i see until i own a bunch because i'm gonna want to play it in like everything um but yeah, that's going to be our video for today. So we got to answer a few questions. And like I said, yeah, if y'all want to send me more questions to answer on the next video, sweet, do that. I'll save them, check them out, and then we can kind of go over things together. Um, we got to go over a lot of different spirits that are coming out of this set. And I'm really excited about almost everything we saw. Like, I think Thalia is a great addition. I'm really excited for Geistlight Snare, the, the three mana counter spell. Um, and I'm pretty excited about being able to play Welcoming Vampire in the blue white spirit shell. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to fit that somewhere as like maybe a two of, because I think the consistent card draws really good. So let me know what cards are you guys most excited about? Like, what do you want to see seeing play in historic or pioneer or even modern like are any of these cards good enough for you to try in modern uh let me know what you think and as always if you like what you're watching make sure to like the video subscribe to the channel and i'll see y'all on the next one